Hello, my name is Megan Strong, and you've got hair. Who are you? I'm Dr. Joshua Austin, in this week for Dr. Michael Detola. In this week's Case of the Week, we're going to see a case that didn't go in the first time, not going to go in the second time. Maybe we'll get it in on the third time. And then in the news, we're going to talk about a dentist who killed a lion, and now it's all over the news. All that and more on today's Chairside Live. Howdy, welcome to episode 145 of Chairside Live. I am obviously not Dr. Michael Detola, nope. but I am Joshua Austin. I'm a private practice dentist in San Antonio, Texas, and I co-host the Accidental Geniuses podcast with Dr. Detola. You can find that at accidentalgeniusespod.com, iTunes, Stitcher, any other podcast outlet. It's an honor to be here today. I'm very happy. I heard that uh, it's your birthday this week. Yes, I just celebrated my 28th birthday. Very and, nice. Uh, yeah, it's I, fun. I brought you a little something straight from Texas. Oh my, well last time, he was one of the doctors that sent us, sent me the barbecue from Texas and it was amazing. So if it's anything like that. I heard you have a bit of a sweet tooth. I have sweet teeth, but yeah, yes. Okay. Uh huh. These, uh, this is Tiff's Treats Cookies that's straight from Austin, Texas. Tiff! They have a secret ingredient in it that nobody knows. Drugs. I don't know if it's drugs. It's probably drugs. Let's find out. Okay, let's see. Okay, chocolate chip, one of my faves. Soft, delicious, feels yeah. chewy. Let's see. Mm. That's seriously so good. I think, I think the secret ingredient, it's either cocaine mm -hmm. or it's brown butter. One of the two. Brown butter. One and the same, yeah. really, in my you know, book. They've done studies and they show that uh, you know sugar produces the same reaction in your brain as a lot of drugs like cocaine do. So, right. so maybe that's what's going on right so now. So I'm an addict, really, is what that is. I and this is so. so good. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Happy birthday. Thank you. We've got a great case of the week where we look at when one impression doesn't turn out, second impression doesn't really turn out, third impression doesn't really turn out. How many times are we going to go around in this wagon? Let's see how that goes. On today's case of the week, we had a doctor send two crowns back, Emacs crowns on number 12 and 13, back for remake, uh, claiming that there were open distal margins when he attempted to insert the crowns. So he smoothed the margins, made a new impression, and sent them back for, for remaking. We have a no-fault remake policy here at Glidewell, so we're going to take a look at this. And when I take a look at this impression, this is made obviously in a, in a plastic triple tray type impression, and when I, or type impression tray. And when I look at the impression here, you know, I just don't see a ton of detail around this marginal area. And he said both the distal margins were open, and so I'm looking kind of in here, and I just don't see a ton of sharp detail. I don't see any flash of where impression material has uh, extruded down into the sulcus on that distal. Um, maybe we have a little flash uh, in here, um, but really certainly that doesn't really go along this way into the distal. So, you know, sometimes that can be okay. Let's take a look at the uh, solid model here. And so we're going to look here and see this. And, you know, the first thing that I notice when I look at this is all the sharp edges that are in here. All of these at this occlusal mesial line angle, right around here, this mesial lingual line angle. Over in here, uh, we have a nice uh, impression pull uh, in here, uh, as you can see on the stone. Uh, and, and really, no, almost no detail in here of a margin, almost no detail in here. We've got some artifact kind of in, in there that just sort of flakes away. Um, so we've, we've got some problems here. You know, first and foremost here, I think the sharp edges are a big problem. Uh, Emacs, ceramics in general, don't like those sharp edges. Those sharp edges uh, tend to be points that will crack uh, most of the ceramics like Emacs or feldspathic porcelain. Bruxer could probably han handle it and, and, and hold up to it, but, but Emacs certainly has a real hard time with sharp edges like that. So I think first and foremost is, is really this in here needs to be smoothed out, and we need really smooth line angles all the way around. As far as the margins go, you know, I think we have a, we have a tissue problem here. Um, I don't know if there was cord placed in this, in this situation or not, but it certainly doesn't look like it. You can see we have pulls sort of all over the lingual with the impression material. Um, you know, if this wasn't, if no cord was packed in this situation, you know, certainly we need some cord here. Um, if cord was packed here, 
maybe we need to modify our chord technique. Maybe add a second chord. Uh, Dr. Totola is a big fan of the two chord technique. Um, maybe some uh, uh, hemostatic retraction paste on top of a first chord, like an expacil or a traxident, um, something like that. But we really need to get impression material down into these areas, and we just can't with the tissue where it is. It just isn't in the right spot. Um, or a diode laser, you know, just laser troughing around these is going to let impression material get down into these uh, margins where, where it just isn't here in this, in this case. So, you know, this doctor took the time to prep these two crowns um, and then tried to seat them. We had open margins uh, and, and ostensibly took a new impression. And this is the second go round. And, and you know, this second go round, I think, is probably not going to yield any better results than the first one. Um, so really, at the end of the day, it comes down to we have to accurately get the lab technician, you know, a sense of what's going on and, and definitely sharp margins to work with. And that just isn't, isn't happening here. Even if there were sharp margins and we could read the margins all the way around and we could get really nice closed margins on the Emacs crown that he asked for, you know, I think this is going to be a problem here. I think this is going to be a problem here. I think this is going to be a problem around here. So we have multiple things going on here that I think need to be corrected. The way that we would correct that I think is in, is in a good solid impression technique, getting the, the gingival retraction out of the way, and then maybe looking at like a reverse preparation technique where we can make sure that we get good reduction where we need it. We use depth cuts to make sure that uh, we are where we need to be. We don't lose space of where we are in the crown. And then going back over and spending 30 seconds or a minute with a football diamond uh, or, or a large uh, barrel diamond to smooth some of these edges here because this just isn't going to hold up to occlusal load uh, in an EMAC situation. Uh, we may have to switch to Bruxier or something like that to be able to, to keep this crown from, from breaking just because of the stress put right here and right here from those sharp edges. So um, spending a few minutes getting the, the gingival tissue out of the way is an important thing. Um, and you can do that any number of ways. Uh, and then making sure that everything is nice and smooth um, really will go a long way to making sure that we don't have remakes uh, and are, are killing our profit um, by having multiple appointments you know, for the same two crowns. Thank you for that, Dr. A. Mike calls me Joshy. I'm not gonna do that. Okay. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Dr. Rubin, and he writes in and says, Hello, Dr. Dutola. I watch Chairside Live all the time. I know you favored the two-chord technique while taking an impression. I try to use that method, but have trouble packing the second chord into the sulcus, and I want to see if you have any tips. Well, Dr. Rubin, I am so sorry that Dr. Dutola isn't the one here to answer your question. Uh, while he is in Australia on a walkabout battling his crushing depression from his midlife crisis. Um, I am not a, as big of a fan of the two core technique as Dr. Detola is. My biggest problem with it is I would always get bleeding when I pulled the first chord, uh, or I'm sorry, the second chord uh, that I packed in that top chord. So I really like uh, hemostatic retraction paste. Expacil was kind of the first one on the market. Traxident came along later. Right now I'm using one called Dries from Parkell. It's in a little compule just like composite is. You just squirt it around. I give it about four or five minutes with a compro, compro cap from Rueco, uh and, and have them bite into it. And it works really, really well. It pushes everything laterally. Uh, the first chord pushes everything down gingivally, um, which is what we want. And we need that to get you know, our exposed margin. Uh, but we want lateral uh, expansion with that second chord or the paste. I think the paste does it well. The problem you're probably having with that top chord is you're trying to pack it down into the sulcus. You want to use a big chord, like a number two chord, pack it in just a little bit. You're not really wanting to push it deep down into the sulcus like that bottom chord. We really just want that lateral compression outward. Um, so try that. Try not packing it in so deep. Just kind of getting it in the surface at, at the margin uh, and letting it push the tissue out laterally. But try some hemostatic retraction paste. Try Traxident, Dries, Expacil, any of those, uh, and I think you'll have good results. The hemostasis is good, and it pushes the tissue laterally. So um, thank you very much for your question. Uh, and I think we have something for, for we, Dr. Rubin. We do, always. Um, we've got two photographs. Uh, one is not, it hasn't, well, who's that? 
I don't, I've I don't already, know who that is. I've already forgotten. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, no, we've got a couple photographs, and I think I'm going to pick the one where I'm wearing the same dress that I'm wearing today because it's just awesome, and I'm pointing. So I'm going to sign that as Mike DeTola. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? That's awesome okay. what so it is. So I'm going to forge his signature, um, and, and so that'll be good. Yep. Do you have any news for us, Megan? I do. A Minnesota dentist, Walter Palmer, is now at the center of a firestorm after he tracked and killed a lion in Zimbabwe. The dentist paid approximately $50,000 to kill Cecil, a protected and famous lion at a national park, a lion that was fitted with a GPS collar and tracked by the Oxford University Research Program. The Zimbabwe Conservation Task Force alleges that Palmer worked with guides to lure the lion from the national park to an unprotected area by strapping a dead animal to their vehicle. Once off national park land, Palmer allegedly shot the lion with a bow and arrow but did not kill him. The group then tracked the wounded animal for 40 hours before shooting and killing him with a gun. Then he was skinned and beheaded. Palmer claims he had no idea that the lion was being studied and relied on the expertise of local guides to ensure a legal hunt. But that excuse isn't satisfying the thousands upon thousands of people who are taking to his dental practices Yelp page and the internet to express their rage. Yeah, this is, this is an ugly story. I, I hope Dr. Detol is careful because I heard that he's in Australia big game hunting for duck-billed platypus. Way too soon. So um, I've got a lot of thoughts. My, my first thought is, is Never hunt anything that has a name. So, right. and and is it Cecil or Cecil? Which what one is I it? What I say? You said you said Cecil, but I don't know. Maybe it's Cecil. I'm, Cecil, either probably. way, half half six of one, half a dozen of another. Um, this is obviously an ugly story, and and it's not good for dentistry because every single headline I've seen yeah. mentions that he's, he's a, dentist. a dentist. Every single one. I wonder what other profession. You know, if he was an orthopedic surgeon, right? Would it say that on there? Or, I think maybe if it, maybe if he was an attorney, it would say that you know an sure. attorney shoots shoots lion, but I don't feel like if he was a tax accountant or right. or <laughs> co-host of Cheer Side Live, right? You know, it, 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 I don't feel like that would make every single headline. No, that is interesting that you bring that up. And there's, I mean, this story, if you, I'm, if you've been living under a rock, would probably be the only way that you haven't heard it. Um, it's seriously taken the news like a firestorm, yeah. which I, you know, mentioned, but it's crazy because it's it's actually talking about like well every I feel like every part of society is coming out of the woodworks sure. to discuss this. You have pro life groups who are comparing it to like big game hunting to abortion. And right. you've got, you know, it's just like it is absolutely insane how much momentum this story is getting. Right. And you're right that it does I think that his profession as a dentist, what does that have to That's do? It has nothing to do with any of but it. But they are saying, well, does this mean that dentists in America yeah. are making too much money? I, I what do you say? I saw that. I saw that column. There was a column in the New York Times, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then there was something in the Washington Post a day later that the headline was basically, why are dentists so damn rich? Right. And, and so, I mean, it's literally such a, a mass... Uh, generalization right. that that the media generally would never make that about anything else about any religion group or right. minority group or anything to make that just just all globally encompassing generalization that dentists are too rich right. is is insane to me. Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm not a hunter. I don't I don't really hunt. Te hunting is big in Texas, right. and I understand sort of hunting a deer, mm -hmm. shooting it cleaning it, taking the meat, you know, sure. living off that meat, m making sausage and jerky and all the stuff that you do with, with deer meat. Um, I get that. He shot it with an arrow mm -hmm. and tracked it for 40 hours while the animal suffered right. before finally shooting it. I don't understand that part of it. I think if you're going to do something like this, do it humanely. Sure. Make the animal, you know, feel as little as pain as possible. I don't understand hunting an apex predator like this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I don't see the need for it. But again, it, it's just not my thing. It's not what I'm into. Right. Um, but I think, and then he beheaded it, skinned it, and just left the carcass sort of mm -hmm. to rot and for right. the buzzards and hyenas to get at. And I think that was sort of, you know, probably not respectful to to the animal and to the area and, and whatnot. So I, he obviously is, is deserves some, some, some whacking on all of that sure. stuff. The, the per, I don't feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for his staff because he's had to close his office. Right. He obviously had $50,000 or whatever it was to be able to pay to go hunt yeah. this animal. So, so finances probably aren't a thing for him. 
but he's got a dental assistant or, or a receptionist yeah. who probably lives paycheck to paycheck and hasn't mm-hmm. been able to work this week and probably can't work next week. And, yeah. you know, uh, that's who I feel sorry for. Um, his Yelp page got over 5,000 one-star reviews in 24 hours. In Insane. Which is, is really interesting to me. He had to shut down his Facebook page because of all the negative attention. Sure. And his website, his like practice website right. was taken yeah. down as well. And they on there before they had shown pictures of like his office staff and there was at least, you know, five to seven people on it. And so like you mentioned, that is so unfortunate for them. Like they didn't shoot that lion. They right. didn't choose that. And so now they're suffering because of that choice. And I by no means am against hunting. Um, I feel like when it serves a purpose uh, for food or income or whatever, I, I'm behind it as long as it's done humanely, as humanely as possible, I guess. But uh, when it comes to big game trophy hunting, it, to me, it's just, they're not going to eat the lion meat. They left right. it there to rot, sure. you know, and it's... I, does anybody eat lion meat? No. I don't feel like that's a thing. No, they don't. Does, Maybe hyenas. Does anybody eat any cat? Is there no. any? Yeah, I don't yeah so that's why it's not for food. And so for me, that's just senseless killing, and I'm not for it. But um, it's just interesting that this man, you know, this one shot. And earlier, speaking of Texas, there was a 19-year-old girl from Texas who yeah. got just absolutely obliterated for, by the media. for. Uh, she went and got a lion in Africa and posted the picture to her Facebook page, and she got death threats. Yeah. And, I mean... To me, it's the amount of backlash sure. that has come the, about the because outrage. of it. It's pure outrage. Right. And, I mean, it's gone to, like, the late night shows where Jimmy Kimmel um, addressed his audience talking about it and was moved to yeah, tears. he was crying. He was yeah. crying. Um, my boy Jimmy Fallon, I don't think, would do that. But um, And we've got a, a petition that for to save, you know, to basically stop big game hunting right. that has almost a million signatures already. And... Um, What's interesting to me, though, and I know that this is not the platform to talk about, you know, very in-depth social ethical issues, but um, without getting too deep into it, I think it's interesting, like, if we talk about, we're talking about the killing of one lion, which, of course, awesome, beautiful animals, amazing, that should be protected, but this this is one lion, and we have, like, thousands of babies in Africa dying from preventable causes, sure. malaria, f- lack of food, lack of clean water. And you don't see that outrage. Right. And to me, that is, that's what's sad about this story is that our country, our world can get so just out of sorts over the killing of one animal, but then, and not to say that people aren't doing great right. things to help the less fortunate. Okay. But Human life doesn't move the needle the same way as, right. as Simba does. Right. The one thing that I found interesting was one of the Yelp reviews uh, posted his pictures of his home and his home address, sort of calling for someone to go take him down. And I think that's silly for a lot of reasons. Number one, he's obviously a hunter. I probably wouldn't go <laughs> trespassing on his land. Right. But the whole outrage is that it took the life of an innocent animal, and now we're putting his family and mm-hmm. and and him him in danger and, and threatening his life. That that doesn't seem. Th- those balance sheets don't seem to, to balance to right. me. And, and I don't understand if we're outraged about the loss of life, threatening his life just doesn't seem all, all that. It, it just it seems silly sense. to me. Right. It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And, you know, it's interesting. There's like uh, when we were talking about which stories to do today, we chose um, to do just one story because this has yeah. so much to discuss with it because there's so many different issues that are built into the story and that it kind of calls calls upon um and it's just interesting to me because there's there's three people three main players in the story you have the the dentist hunter be clear to make sure we know he's a dentist like that matters and then you have a uh professional hunter and then the landowner and apparently uh dr palmer had said which he said to the world basically that he thought that he was at and I, on his defense, which I'm not defending him, but he says that he had no idea that he basically what happens is that people who have the money to go do these hunts, they hire professional hunters through sure. services, and guides. Yeah. guides, and they trust them that they're taking care of all of the legal regulations right. or whatever, because most of the time these the hunters aren't going to know about the laws of Zimbabwe right. and whatever. So they're trusting these guides and professional hunters to know all the legal stuff that they need and they're trusting them that everything's going to go as planned and so 
he, he trusts this guide and then basically what they did was they took, they lured the lion outside of the park onto this landowner's um, land and they're saying that he did not, the landowner did not have a lion in his quota for 2015 to be able to kill. Kind of like how you get a deer tag here sure. or whatever. Um, and so, and then, but the, the interesting part is that uh, they tried to destroy the collar. That was the tracking collar. Oh, yeah. The so cover-up. The, the cover-up's cover up. always worse than the crime. Yes. It's definitely the biggest dental story of the year, and it fell into my lap as I came in to co-host today. So yeah. it was... I think at least for us, it gave us a lot of good material to cover. It did. And I think Bill Cosby is thrilled with all of this. <laughs> he's, he's the big winner here. That was a great discussion, Megan. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Well, that about does it for this week's Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Joshua Austin, my bloke, Dr. Michael Detola, Megan Strong, the rest of the crew here at CSL, thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. Look at that. He watches the show. See you next time. And then in the news, we're going to talk about the lion that's making headlines. Oh, Dutch. Dutch, right. <laughs> Cookie, good enough for me. Sorry. Okay. I don't watch basketball because it's nothing but squeaks and whistles. Listen. The, what, next time you watch basketball, tell me that you hear anything other than squeaks and whistles. Golf, whispers and claps. What do you hear in football? America. <laughs> <laughs> Mike calls me Joshy. I'm not going to do that.